have your Bibles, and I hope you have, turn to Genesis with me this morning, please, chapter number 3. The book of Genesis, Bereshith, book of beginnings, first book of the Holy Bible, canon of Scripture. Moses wrote the book of Genesis about 1400 B.C., somewhere along in there. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 1. The scripture says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now watch this. For God doth know, here we go, he has a knowledge of God that she doesn't have. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name we pray, amen. Now you're confronted immediately in the word of God with two opposing lines of revelation. Knowledge, if you please. One comes from the revelation of God in Scripture about sin, the fall of man, salvation, and our blessed Redeemer. The other source of knowledge, or as you might say, wisdom, comes from the serpent, and it's that simple. It runs through the course of the Bible from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. It either comes from God Almighty or it comes from the serpent. There is no other source. And if you accept God's Word as truth, as absolute infallible truth, as inspired Scripture, if you accept the canon of Scripture, all 66 books, as a divine revelation from God, then you are on the right side. Believe me, you are receiving what God said as He manifests and reveals Himself to mankind. And you know without a question that our problem is not intellectual, our problem is not monetary, our problem is not an education, our problem is sin. And the Bible deals with the issue of sin. It talks about the origin of sin. It talks about the consequences of sin. It talks about the power of sin. And then it talks about the remedy for sin. And the remedy for sin is not doing or being or knowing. The remedy of sin is a person. The Lord Jesus Christ came to give himself a ransom for us. Therefore, sin is satisfied, settled, completed, and defeated in one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is Orthodox Christianity, always has been, always will be. From day one, Christians have never argued nor had a problem understanding the issue of sin. And believe me, that is the issue of the Bible. And once you get that issue settled, then the Bible can open up to you for a, and become an intellectual book. It can become a histor history book, a book of prose and poetry, and all the other things, and even science from Scripture. But the main point of the Word of God is you and your relationship with the Lord, and sin is the great factor that stands between you and God. And there's only one that can remove it, and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that is applied to the soul of the sinner. So, my friend, this morning we have had in the last few years uh, the prophecy of G.H. Pember that was made in the 1800s. He said this, and the book that he wrote is Earth's Earliest Ages, and it is an outstanding work, Earth's Earliest Ages by G.H. Pember. He said this back in the 1800s. He said, the floodgates are about to open, and when the floodgates open, it is yet to be seen the damage that it will do to humanity, mankind, and how it will change the face of the earth. Well, friend, this is 2015, and the floodgates are wide open. They are wide open. People today don't give a second thought to attacking the very foundation, the fundamental of the faith, what we believe as Christians. It does, it's as if they were talking about Mickey Mouse. They have no consciousness whatsoever in the, in, in, in the all-encompassing statements that they make about our Lord Jesus Christ. For years, books have been written about the Lord Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. For years, work has been out there. This stuff has all been out there. There's nothing new about it. But in the last few years, two movies have been made. One is Dan Brown's movie on the Da Vinci Code. The other is the work that's going on right now on the History Channel by Scott Walper, who is a forensic geologist. Now, these two men could probably not be any more different. 
but the thesis of what they're talking about is very similar. They are both propounding a heresy that is attacking and assaulting the very foundation of what you believe as a Christian. I cannot emphasize it enough this morning. I am crying in the wilderness as hard as I know how. I want you to wake up. Your faith is being assaulted, the very foundation of it. It's being undermined, and the, and the rug is about to be jerked right out from under your feet, and the whole church is going to come crumbling down because people are going to leave it by droves if what these men say stands. So it's my responsibility as a pastor of the Word of God as a minister of Christ, to assault the assaulter. It's my job today to come against the heresy and lie that is being perpetrated against the church of God, especially our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's talk about that this morning. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 44 and verse 15, I've got a lot of ground, so I want to move quickly through it. We'll be here all day. Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us, in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Watch this. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings to her, we have wanted all things and been consumed by the sword and by the famine. You say, why is that so important, preacher? It is important because Israel had migrated into northern Egypt. They were in the land around Alexandria, Egypt. And it was in this area that became a hotbed of Gnosticism. And it was there that they were burning incense to the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven in Egypt is Isis. The queen of heaven in Babylon is Semiramis. The queen of heaven can be spread out all over the place with different names. For example, Diana of the Ephesians. But they all relate to the same thing. The queen of heaven is a goddess, a feminine god. She's a goddess. And notice, she's the queen of heaven. She has an attachment to heaven. She contact, contacts heaven. Fallen angels, in other words, gave her her power and her authority. Note carefully. In the book of Jeremiah, they said plainly, as long as we served Isis and we burned incense to Isis, we were being fed. We were being taken care of. Everything was going okay. You say, preacher, how can that be? Listen. There are people right now in Hollywood, California, that will tell you in a heartbeat that they sold their soul to Satan for the prosperity that it gave, and they have more than money can buy. They'll tell you that there is power in serving Satan. Is there, preacher? Yes. Absolutely there's power in it. So put that in your mind. Tuck it away somewhere in the back of your mind. For that is a very important thing to understand, that it is not in vain that someone burns incense to the devil. It is not in vain that people worship Satan because he has power. And that is a separate subject. Don't have time for all of that. But if you've ever read your Bible, you realize that he's capable of doing far above and beyond what any human being could possibly do. But in northern Egypt, North Egypt, North Africa rather, where Egypt is located, it was a hotbed of Gnosticism. Pythagoras was a Greek philosopher whose student was Socrates, whose student was Plato, whose student was, uh, was uh, 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 what's the last one? Socrates, Aristotle. These Greek philosophers learned their trade from Pythagoras, who had gone to the east. He had traveled into the Hindu, Buddhist, Brahmin culture. He had carried back Eastern mysticism with him, its teachings. He carried it back to Greece. Plato was the one who talked about Atlantis. 
Plato is the one who talked about the star men. Plato is the one who talked about evolution. Plato is the one who was the one who put the seedbed into Greek philosophy about these gods and goddesses and all of this stuff, and he got it from the East. But the point is this, it had infiltrated Western thinking. It had come into the minds of Western men, and it had come into the mind of the Jew. And in North Africa, it was a hotbed of, 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 of Gnostic teaching and Gnostic philosophy. Say, so why is that important to me, preacher? Because in 1945, they dug up a bunch of papyri at Nag Hammadi. And the papyri they dug up were the book's Gnostic Gospels. And these Gnostic Gospels are what they are using today to try to say that the New Testament is wrong, that the Gnostics got it right, and the Jesus they preach is not the is not is, is better than the Jesus of the Bible. It's a truer portrayal of who Jesus truly is. Here's one of the scholarly philosophies. And that is up until the time of Constantine, 325 AD. At the time of Constantine at the Council of Nicaea, that the Christian world wasn't even sure about who Jesus was. That he was just a man to most of them. That there was a great argument going on and controversy among the Christians about who Jesus Christ really was. And so my friend, they, 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 they posit this theory today and a lot of people have bought into it. But when you go back and you read what some of these early Christians had to say, for example, John the Apostle had a direct disciple. His name was Polycarp. Polycarp had a direct disciple. His name was Irenaeus. These men in their lifetime fought this Gnostic heresy. They went against, against it tooth and toenail because they realized that it was a pure assault upon the foundation of the church of God and upon the identity and deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Polycarp said. He said this in the first century after Christ. Remember, these philosophers and these, these, these so-called scholars are saying that for the first 300 years they weren't sure about who Jesus was, that he might have been just a man so he could have married Mary Magdalene and they could have had children just like all the rest of us. That's all he was, they're saying. But listen to the words of Polycarp that were said within the first 100 years after Christ. He says, let us then continually persevere in our hope and earnest of our righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, but endured all things for us that we might live in him. That's what Polycarp said. Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, wrote within the first 200 years after Christ. Here's what he says. Church fathers Irenaeus and Tertullian addressed Gnosticism in the second century in works titled Against Heresies and so forth. Here's a quote from that. There is current also an epistle to the Laodiceans and another to the Alexandrians, both forged in Paul's name to further the heresy of Marcion, a Gnostic, and several others which cannot be received into the Catholic Church. Please understand that when these church fathers in the first two or three hundred years after Christ use the word Catholic, it has nothing to do with the Catholic Church today. It is a word that means universal. In plainer words, universal Christendom. Those who are believers in Christ, they say, for it is not fitting that gall be mixed with honey. In other words, Irenaeus and Tertullian, within the first couple of hundred years after Christ, were already battling these Gnostic philosophers, and that's what they are. Don't let anybody ever tell you that a Gnostic is a Christian. He is far, far from being a Christian. A Gnostic does not believe that he's a sinner. A Gnostic does not believe that he's a fallen creature. A Gnostic does not believe that he needs a redeemer. A Gnostic believes that his salvation lies in inner knowledge. That in retrospect, looking within yourself and finding the divine spark in you. It is all in the head. Gnosticism is a religion, an esoteric religion, 
a elitist religion of people who think that they're smarter than you, above you. They have a knowledge and wisdom you don't have. That knowledge and wisdom is going to turn them and transform in them into this greater light that becomes one with the universe. Gnosticism, therefore, is the enemy of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, in North Africa, where Gnosticism was a hotbed, there Isis, the queen of heaven, was transformed into Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene of the New Testament was a sinner that got saved. There's not a word in the New Testament about Mary Magdalene having any other relationship with Christ as simply a sinner and her Savior, like all the rest of them in the New Testament. But these people take Mary Magdalene and they transform her into a goddess. And by transforming her into a goddess, they essentially elevate her above the Lord Jesus Christ. Her relationship with Christ, therefore, according to this, this Gnostic philosophy, is that she is the goddess and Christ is subservient to her. And so therefore we have churches today, for example, let me read one for you. Gnostic churches that call themselves Christian. A growing number of churches in the United States and around the world are embracing a New Age lie. Many churches have introduced A Course in Miracles, Yoga, Silver Mind Control, Unity Teachings, metaphysics, metaphysics into their teaching material. Some churches have taken a further step in hiring onto their staffs individuals who hold to metaphysical worldview. Say, is that important, preacher? Listen carefully. A seminar was held at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. Now get over the shock and listen. Wisdom weaving, women embodied in faiths, was held at the school in February 1990. If one looks at the schedule of the seminar, it is obvious that the emphasis was not on orthodoxy. Linda Fennell, a follower of Wicca, that's a witch, and one of the speakers spoke on the subject, returning the goddess through Dianic witchcraft. Two of the keynote speakers were of a New Age persuasion. In fact, one, Sir Jose Hobday, works with Matthew Fox and Starhawk at the Institute for Creation Spirituality. What's going on, preacher? I'll tell you what's going on. Churches have closed their Bible and opened their doors to the New Age, to the, to, to the witch, to the Satanist, to the Luciferian, to anything that claims it has this esoteric, in other words, inward hidden knowledge, and they want to tap into it. Why? Because they have rejected the authority of the Word of God. You say, is that important, preacher? You better believe it. I have no business inviting a shaman or a witch to get up here in this pulpit and say anything to you. For they have nothing to say that we need to hear. As a matter of fact, just the reverse. I got a lot to say that they need to hear. And the first thing they need to hear is this. Ye must be born again. But keep this in mind because this is important because it will connect later in the message. North Africa is where they changed Isis, the queen of heaven, into Mary Magdalene. And a group that did this shows up later on in movies and in books and in documentaries. The Da Vinci Code is connected directly with North Africa. Scott Walters, America Unearthed. When he's talking about Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ being husband and wife is connected directly with Mary Magdalene of North Africa with Isis, the Egyptian goddess, who was transformed into Mary Magdalene. That's a separate thing altogether. I spent hours studying that, but we don't have all day. 
But the bottom line is this, that these people at will transform identities from one to another as it suits their purpose, and they don't agree among themselves. It's a remarkable thing when you begin to dig into this, when they speak with such authority, with such scholarly authority about these documents that they found. For example, I did a search, and the search that I did was this. I did many searches, but this one in particular. What is the earliest reference that we can find where Mary Magdalene is called the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't you think that's illogical? Don't you think that's a logical reference? What is the earliest reference that we can find? Can I find something in the first century? Can I find something that comes from North Africa, from Alexandria, Egypt? Can I find something that's written by a so-called Christian within first century means, folks, all the way up to the year 100? Do you realize that the canon of Scripture, this book that I've got in my hand right here, this book was completed about 90 to 95 A.D. by the Apostle John. The last book in the Bible closed the canon, and that was the book of Revelation, about 1995 A.D. Remember, Polycarp is a direct disciple of John the Apostle, folks. He touched back to the first, he touched the twelve. Polycarp was martyred for his faith. And then Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. So we've gone all the way back to Christ. Can I find one shred of evidence, Mr. Walter? Mr. Brown, Brown, you've made millions of dollars off of writing fiction and calling it fact and talking about a marriage between Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me one reference to one piece of ancient material that goes back far enough. And here's what I find. By researching this, I'll find much stuff begins to show up 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900 A.D., this stuff begins to pop up here, pop up there, pop up here, pop up there. You say, why is that important, preacher? It's important because Gnosticism had had time to develop and spread, and by spreading and developing, it had become the enemy of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. There's no cross in Gnosticism, folks. Amen. They deny that he was crucified. They deny he died. They deny he, was, they deny he was buried, and they deny he rose from the dead, and yet they say they're Christians. They deny the blood atonement. They deny everything that it takes for you to get saved. Right. But here a woman, a scholar... Karen King, I think is her name. That's her name. She's the professor of religion at Harvard Divinity School. Harvard Divinity School. You understand what I'm talking about? Harvard was started, I think, in the 1600s as a college that would train young men to preach the Word of God. And no doubt turned out many outstanding ministers who love the Lord and preach the Word of God. Since then, Harvard Divinity School has turned in to one of the most liberal schools in the country. But even they, listen to what I'm going to read to you. Even they have this to say about one of their own professors. Cambridge, Massachusetts, April the 10th, 2014. A wide, Harvard, this is from Harvard Divinity School. Cambridge, Massachusetts. A wide range of scientific testing indicates that a papyrus fragment containing the words, Jesus said to them, my wife, is an ancient document dating between the 6th to the 9th centuries, common era, CE. Its contents may originally have been composed as early as the 2nd to 4th centuries. May have, but you don't prove anything by may have. The fragment does not, listen carefully, this is Harvard, folks. The fragment does not in any way provide evidence that the historical Jesus was married as Karen King, the Hollis Professor of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School, has stressed since she announced the existence of the fragment in the fall of 2012. Rather, the fragment belongs to early Christian debates over whether it was better for Christians to be celibate virgins or to marry and have children. The fragment is weighing in on this issue according to King. Interpretation. If a fragment existed, an ancient fragment of anything that connected the Lord Jesus Christ to Mary Magdalene as husband and wife, you better believe that Harvard Divinity School would have it plastered all over 
their pages. They'd publicize it to high heaven. It would go everywhere it could possibly go, yet there's not a word they even have to say. Uh, one of our own professors who said that this papyrus fragment that mentions Christ and Mary Magdalene being husband and wife, they even have to come along and say that one of our own professors has crossed the line, essentially, because she is saying without question that we have proof positive that Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ were married by using a piece of uh, papyrus that showed up six, seven, eight, nine hundred years after Christ, a piece of Gnostic garbage. And Harvard, to retain some semblance of credibility, says, sorry, we cannot subscribe to that. We don't agree with what she's saying. Now let that settle in. Let it settle in this morning that we cannot find and I'll spend more time after I get through this message today. We cannot find a primary source anywhere that goes back to the ancients within the first century after Christ that connects Mary Magdalene with the Lord Jesus Christ as husband and wife. That's a big deal, okay? Let the, get a hold of that. Get a hold of that. When some professor, some preacher, some theologian, some movie maker, somebody that's in it to make, there's a lot of money in it, no question about that. Somebody that's in all this stuff, and, and, and they're pumping this stuff in the head of people, and they're speaking as if we have all this authority, we have all this scholarly work, we have all this stuff connecting Mary Magdalene with Christ, show it to us. Amen. What we do find is time and time and time and time again that this stuff surfaces and it's proven to be a hoax. And I don't know in this case, if time will tell, this may be proven to be a hoax. Who knows? But I want you to understand this morning, because this is important to go further in what I'm saying. It's all based on supposition, fanciful notions. They like for it to be true, but there's absolutely no reference anywhere to be found that dates back to the time of Christ where Mary Magdalene and Christ were husband and wife. And it always, and I read this, what one scholar said, and I thought it was a good perspective on it. One who had spent a lot of time studying Gnostic materials said, you know, it's amazing how the Gnostics seldom ever quote the Old Testament. They hardly ever refer to the Old Testament. They spend all their time talking about this Gnostic Jesus, this Gnostic Jesus, this, this spirit that came upon this 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 mortal man, this human being like all the rest of us, this, this sinner like all the rest of us are. And this spirit came on him, and then the spirit left him. And, but they don't quote the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is quoted over and over and over and over again in the New Testament. And the reason that it's quoted over and over and over again in the New Testament is because the New Testament continues the thread that starts in the Old Testament. The New Testament continues the same line of reasoning and thought and revelation from God as the Old Testament. And that is that man is a fallen creature. He needs to be born again. And that Christ is the only way that you'll ever make it into glory. I thought that was quite a thing. And that just popped up one day when I was reading. And thank God for a little handfuls on purpose. A little nugget that falls here and there. Because I'll be honest with you this morning, folks. I ain't spending the rest of my life reading Gnostic garbage. <laughs> I got better things to do. Would you like to hear a little bit of it? Gnostic garbage? One, <laughs> I know. <laughs> One Gnostic text has Christ as glad and laughing on the cross, a radiant being of Gnostic light. You understand where we're coming from now? Here's another one, the infancy gospel of Thomas. Don't mix it with the gospel of Thomas. This is a different one. The infancy gospel of Thomas has Christ as a five-year-old temper tantrum throwing tyrant, literally demonic. That fits entirely. Folks, that's no surprise. That fits with him being just a mortal human being like all the rest of us. That's what they want him to be. The Gospel of Philip, second or third century, has Christ loved Mary more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often. Then the Gospel of Thomas Listen to this one. It's usually dated 1st or 2nd century. A lot of these dates are very, very uh, 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 uncertain. But in any event, the Gospel of Thomas, dated 1st, 2nd century, 
was also among the finds at Nagama in 1940 with short references to Mary generally regarded as Mary Magdalene. Listen to this. Simon Peter said to them, quote, Let Mary go forth from among us, for women are not worthy of the life. Jesus said, Behold, I shall lead her, that I may make her male in order that she also may become a living spirit like you males. For every woman who makes herself male shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That sounds like political correct stuff coming out in 2015. All right. You want to hear what the real Peter said? In 1 Peter 3, 5, he said this about women. He said, For after this manner in old time the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. That sounds to me like the Apostle Peter believed that a woman was on the same footing as a man when it came to be, born, came to be uh, qualified to be born again. Amen. That's what the real Peter said. And that's what came from the Word of God. So what we do now, we come down from all of that. I hope I've laid enough with you. We come down from that, and we come down to the priori of Zion. And this is what Dan Brown and probably Scott Walter is basing a lot of what they are propagating to people on, is the priori of science. What is it, preacher? Well, it is alleged to have started in 1099 by Godfrey of Bullion on Mount Zion in the kingdom of Jerusalem. The priori was devoted to installing a secret bloodline of Merovingian dynasty on the thrones of France and over the rest of the world. Now, it gets sinister now. Now, of course, the bloodline that they're referring to is the bloodline of the union of Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ. Through this bloodline, a king in France will one day rule over the world and bring peace and prosperity. Making any connections? Now, uh, another version of this plot, and this is Dan Brown's version, accepts the premise of the bloodline but listen to how he spins it. But focuses on the feminine goddess that Mary Magdalene was a god, Isis, and the union of Eastern occultism and mysticism with Western theology will produce the Messiah. Now, is the world looking for a Messiah? Yes. In 1989, a traditionalist Christian author named J.R. Church, now this was a brother I'm talking about here now, this man's a brother, claimed in his book, Guardians of the Grail, that the priori of Sion is an anti-Christian Masonic conspiracy. Now, these are his words, quote, The order of the Knights Templar was, at first, only a front organization for a more secretive group known as the priori of Sion, whose real purpose, listen carefully, was to capture the wealth of the world establish their own world government and introduce a Merovingian king to sit upon a throne in Jerusalem, they are said to be the true possessors of the Jewish temple treasury and the behind-the-scenes controllers of the world's currencies. Now, who's to say? I think Brother Church here was probably pretty close. He may miss it a pointer there. Who knows? The thing about secret societies and this esoteric stuff is that they only allow so much to go out. And they're going to control what you think and what you know. But let me tell you something that I'm firmly convinced of this morning. There is an elitist group in this world that do pull the strings. Some call it a shadow government. Some call it the Illuminati. Call it whatever you want to. But they are working toward the purpose of bringing about a new world order or a one world government. And the process of doing that, they are going to change the religions of the world into one unified, one world religion. And in the process of doing that, they are going to put you through some of the worst suffering that humanity's ever been through. The old picture of the phoenix out in Arizona, for example, is a good, is a good indication of it. It is this bird that rises from the ashes of defeat or obscurity. It rises up. And then, in the pro and, and then in the cycle, it goes back, and then it rises up again. The idea is that it is order out of chaos. 
The idea of order out of chaos means that in order for us to have a one world government and a one world religion, we are going to have to make the world so uncomfortable for people that they will cry out to us for a deliverer, for somebody to bring in peace on the earth. And when they cry out to us for somebody to bring peace on the earth, we'll have our man waiting in the wings. And he'll do exactly what we bid him to do. According to the book of Revelation, chapter number 13, and throughout the rest of that book, this woman, the religious harlot that sits on this scarlet-colored beast, this woman at first is befriended by the Antichrist, this one-world ruler, this one-world government. But then he turns against her, and he destroys her. So let me tell all of these religious folks out there today that are flowing with the flow, that are part of what's happening. They don't want to rock the boat. They're accepting any spirit and every spirit that comes down the pike. You're going to sail on for a while. You're going to have your peace and your prosperity, and it's all going to look good. But the day is going to come when the man of sin turns against you. And when he turns against you, you're finished. According to the book of Revelation, which I believe is true, I'm a Bible believer. I believe the book from Genesis to Revelation. That gives me great peace. I sleep good at night for three or four hours. <laughs> but I sleep when I'm there. It's nothing at 3 o'clock in the morning to see me up walking around, wandering around. But God takes care of me. I believe the Bible. You should have heard what was said in Sunday school this morning. Eric Nafziger, in the last, latter part of his lesson, he used an illustration he picked up this guy standing on the side of the road, and he picked this guy up, and he, and he didn't take him too far, but he said he had his Bible on the, on the dash of the car, and he, said that, and he said the man looked at that, and he said, uh, he, I think he said, is that a King James Bible? And, uh, and Eric said, yes, that's a King James Bible. And he said something to him, well, a good, good. He said, because my life is a waste. My life's ruined. He said, I've, he said I am going down the tubes. And he said, I'll tell you how it happened to me. He said, I believed the King James at one time. Then I got into all these other uh, translations and these perversions. And he said, what it did was destroy my faith in the Word of God. He said, but now I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Hallelujah to God. I'm coming back. By the grace of God, you'll never hear me correct this book. It'll correct me. You'll never hear me get up here and tell you it's got in, uh, uh, mistranslations in it. It's out of date. Uh, uh, you'll never hear that. By the grace of God, you're not going to hear that come out of my mouth because I believe the Word of God. And when I say Word of God, I'm talking about the AV 1611. This book right here, I believe God's Word is infallible. I believe that. That becomes a foundation and a basis for what I believe. That means that when any man, I don't care who he is, I don't care who he is, gets up and has the gall and, and audacity to attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and the foundation of what I believe, I look at him and say, Hoss, you are my enemy. Not you in the flesh, the spirit that energizes you, the one that, that, uh, that drives you to do what you're doing. Uh, this afternoon, they'll be playing a, a, a big football game, the Super Bowl. Now, folks, some folks don't realize, but a lot of people, that's a big deal to them. I remember when they played the first Super Bowl. And so today they're playing, I don't know which one it is, 45, 50, whatever it is. They're playing the Super Bowl this afternoon. During the halftime, I have been reading from different sources on the Internet that there is supposed to be an occult performance, that it gets very occultic. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I have no, you know, I don't, I'm like uh, the fellow that said all I know is what I read in the papers. I don't know. But here's what's happening. This is what's going on, I believe. It is like a gauge. They're measuring the American people. How far have you gone? How much can you take? How much more, how much more before we let the hammer fall? How much more before we call in the chips? How much more before we give you the mark? How far have you gone? So we'll find out. There's some folks out there who, they're <laughs> very good at it. They'll check this stuff out, just like that last Olympics in, in London, England. My goodness gracious, you talk about a cult. 
My. And so we'll see. We'll find out. How far have you come? So what about the priority? What about, what about, what about Mary Magdalene? What about all this, preacher? Isn't there any truth in all this? No. You show me one document that goes back to where that New Testament was written, to that time, not something that was manufactured five, six, seven, eight hundred years later by a bunch of Gnostics. Find a primary source that tells me that Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ were a husband and wife. I'd like to see it. And you're not going to find it because it doesn't exist. Right. If it existed, the Harvard School of Divinity would let you know it in a heartbeat. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist. Now, you know, you can make stuff up today and make it look old and plant it. And one guy in France did that. He made up a bunch of stuff about the priority of Zion, uh, Zion, and he planted it and made it look like it was old and ancient. And then come to find out it was all a hoax. So I hope today that your faith has been restored in this book. You've got nothing to fear. You don't have to hide. These, these people don't know something that you don't know. The Lord God gave us the Bible to show you the way. And who is the way? Amen. So what do you believe about him, preacher? I believe he's God Almighty in the flesh. I believe he's sinless and perfect. I believe his precious blood washes my sins away. I believe he died on the cross. He was buried on the third day, rose again. And I believe he's coming again as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day I'm going to be glad to take my place and fall down before him and say, Blessed Jesus, Son of God, hallelujah. I know whom I have believed persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Bless his holy name. Amen. Ain't nothing Dan Brown, ain't nothing Scott Walter or any of the rest of them say will affect that one bit. I'll say this and shut up. The reason Brown and Walter are so destructive is because, not because they're coming out with any new thing, it's because they're making movies. People don't read, but when they put it on the silver screen and they can watch a movie, or a documentary, then they see it, then it comes alive. That's why they're dangerous. Yep. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to stand and preach Christ and him crucified. And glory to his holy name. My hope, my future, my life, my all I am is in the name of the Lord Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved as the blessed Lamb of God. I pray all that heard me this morning will hear this later, see it later. I pray they know him as the Lord Jesus Christ, not some Gnostic fabrication, some esoteric, some Hindu, Buddhist, Brahmin uh, piece of garbage, but they know the true Christ, the one who went to the cross for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.